The question is, which team allowed the fewest points in a 16-game season? Just what a sweet moment we had here. D. Wood comes up to me as we went to the last break, and he says, Greeny, we didn't do a trivia question today. Like, you missed it. You felt bad, so we will have you answer the... Come on, that's nice. That's a nice moment. Let's have you answer the question, which team has the record for fewest points allowed in a 16-game season? I'm going 2,000 Baltimore Ravens. Hambo, he got you. That's exactly right. The 2,000 Boom. Ravens. Yeah. Is ah. 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 <laughs> they allowed 165 yeah. points. Right now, the Patriots are allowing fewer than seven points per game as they get set to take on the Browns this weekend. Speaking of the Browns and Baker Mayfield, he was fined $12,500 by the NFL for criticizing the officiating after Cleveland's loss to Seattle in week six. They were back at practice yesterday after the bye, and Mayfield stood by those comments on the officials. No, I knew I was going to get fined, but it needs to be said. People have to be held accountable for their job. Um, when it affects my job, it, it sucks because it's not in my control. Okay, so when you hear Baker Mayfield a week and a half removed from the game talking about the officiating from a week and a half ago against Seattle as they get set to play New England, what is the first thought that enters your mind? Is that he's a leader of this team, and whatever he does publicly, it sends a message to the rest of the team. While I agree with him that they need to be held as responsible as he's held because they have a job to do that impacts his job, I don't think saying it right then, coming out of a bye week, headed into a game against the best defense possibly in NFL history, you don't want your team to be focusing on this nonsense. You tell them, like, I need to improve, and you need to improve. We need to improve. We need to focus on what we're doing, not look outside to blame others. People. I'm with you, Nick. I get it. We say this is Baker. This has always been Baker. He's been outspoken. But at what point do we say, hey, Baker, enough is enough. You're about to play the Patriots. And we can tell you one thing. The refs are not going to be the difference between whether they win or they lose that game. Baker's play and delivering the ball to his stud receivers and running backs, etc. that'll be the difference. So to me, it's just like, bro, <clears throat> just shut it. You're, go you're coming off a bye week. What are we talking about right now? Shafty, it feels to me like we've been saying for the longest time, Mayfield is going to lead his own way. He is a different character yeah. than we've ever seen. And the point I've tried to make all along is, I don't know that it won't work, but I know we've never seen it before. That's not how quarterbacks traditionally have acted and led in NFL history. So if he's going to do it, he's really sort of blazing his own trail here. He is. It's unusual. It's different. Quarterbacks usually are more reserved, more laid back, more conservative. <laughs> They don't call out a running back when he's holding out. They don't call out a quarterback on another team in a GQ article. They don't start talking about the officiating and get fined. It is different. And, again, to Damien's point earlier, again, I don't have a problem with him. This is who he is, and this has made him right. the man and player he's become, which was good enough to become the number one pick. But, again, they're 2-4 and four right now. <laughs> they're 2-4, and four, and they're playing the defending world champion Patriots this week. So, they're really fighting for their season because if they fall to two and five, good luck clawing your way back from a two yeah. and five hole exactly. to try to make the postseason. And look, I've been saying since they lost that game that think how different everything would feel if the Ravens were five and one or something right. like that rather than the division kind of hovering around where they are. You've been in so many locker rooms. You've played with so many different quarterbacks. If the quarterback is that kind of guy, what does that do to the rest of the locker room? It just – oh, it just put, it's, it puts everybody in, in a – I would say, an uh, uncomfortable situation. Because guys in the locker room, what do they want? They just want to focus on getting prepared for the team. They don't want to be talking about things that really is out of their control. The way the, 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 way the refs go about their business is out of my control. Yeah. I don't want to talk about the refs. I, I have a hard enough job preparing for the New England Patriots. And you bring it up, refs, and things are irrelevant but, right now. I mean, to be fair to Baker, football is an uncomfortable game. I don't care if my comments make you uncomfortable. Play football. And also, this is not like a referendum on him as a leader. We would all love this leadership style but, if he would stop but throwing you know, the ball but, to the other team. Well, the, that's problem is, the problem isn't him talking to the media. The problem is he's not playing. But are well. those two things completely separate from each other is what I'm asking you? Absolutely. I think you can talk trash and still play good, good football. I don't think – or you can be outspoken – still play good football. The yeah, issue, but you're not playing good football, yeah. so why are you keep talking? Okay, that's that's a fair criticism, but stop. We can't pretend like this, that his leadership, we can say his leadership is bad because they're losing. They're losing because he's bad. Can I ask you one very quick question to wrap this up? Does anyone else think D. Wood is more intimidating without the beard? There's something <laughs> about is that, that, that one shot we just saw of you there, that tight look on D. Wood, man, I'm not going to lie to you. Like, I, I started sort of rolling slowly in this direction. <laughs> well, people think I'm a teddy bear, but listen, I always said there's always two sides to a football player. Yeah, you lose the beard all of a sudden you're a lot scary <laughs> uh, meanwhile let's talk about Chiefs quarterback Patrick Mahomes this is scary 
He was back on the practice field to at least some degree yesterday, less than a week after a scary-looking knee injury against the Broncos. And head coach Andy Reid has not ruled out Mahomes for Sunday night's game against the Green Bay Packers. And so we're having our meeting this morning, and all of us are kind of speculating, well, is this just kind of the thing that you say? And Shefty, you immediately turned to us and said, no, this is no, they're, not, they're not playing games here. They're not playing games. When he got hurt, this was a week-to-week injury. And I know that we're all trying to provide medical insights and information. The truth is, if he's healthy enough to play, he will play. Now, I don't think we'll see him on tonight. But I think the bigger point of the fact that he's out there practicing already tells you that he's not far away from returning, whether that's Sunday night against Green Bay, which I think would be unlikely, but not out of the question, or even the next week against I, Minnesota. I, I could get in trouble by assuming that some people are smart when maybe they aren't, but assuming that they're smart, this is just gamesmanship. It reminds me of when Drew Brees got hurt and Shefty came on here and said Taysom Hill is a realistic starter. No, that was foolishness, and this is foolishness also. <laughs> they're not gonna they're not gonna put Drew Brees, or excuse me, they're not gonna put Patrick Mahomes out there on just fresh off a knee injury like that, the same way they're not gonna start their H back at quarterback. So like it's the same thing. I don't think this is anything other than they're trying to make sure that the opponent has to prepare for Patrick Patrick Mahomes and all that. They're not crazy. What do you think? You put him out on the field? Are you putting Patrick Mahomes out on the field? Yesterday, what, the little bit of practice they let us see yesterday, he is limping so badly, it doesn't look like he could run from here to there. I'll, this is what I, all I'll say. Do all it. I'll say is this. Don't do it. Don't. I've seen players get concussions where the whole world is watching like there's no way they'll play. And then they're out there the next week. Players play. I don't know how many times I gotta so, tell you, me no, let me or tell, tell you anyone out let me there. Tell you if, if, if a player, if a player feels like I can go out there and let me contribute ex- and play football and not let my teammates down, let me explain something. They to you. will try their best, their damnedest to do it. Let me explain something to you about football. It's this game that a lot of people play. And you know who doesn't play football? NFL quarterbacks. They are not players. They don't play football the same way. They aren't treated the same way. They are they are endangered species, and they should be protected as such, especially when you are Patrick Mahomes. Don't be crazy. It would be sure. crazy. I would not put it past them, but I would agree that it would be crazy with all the things they have out there in front of them. All right, much more football as our morning continues. But... Back to the NBA, because these are two teams of whom we expect a lot in the Eastern Conference. Sixers, Celtics, Al Horford, former teammates, ringing the bell now as a member of the 76ers. And Richard Jefferson, he's got a couple of new teammates, Ben Simmons and Joel Embiid, and they were working it back and forth early. They're going to be one of the best teams in the NBA. Not, we're not talking about just the Eastern Conference. In the entire NBA, I think that they're going to have one of the top two records. You can't, they continue to work around. Look at Ben Simmons go up and throw it down with a left hand. Simmons with a very big first half, a big night all the way around. But in case you're wondering, it, he did not attempt the field goal from outside <laughs> the painted area. But look at them playing defense against Kemba. And that's what it is, that size. That's what everyone talked about, this defense for, for Philly. The one question was going to be the way they can shoot the ball. Who is going to take a crucial shot late in game? But this defense, they might not have to hit many shots late in game with that type of defense. Kemba just 12 points, again, on a night that Kyrie scored 50 now as a net. Fourth quarter, Sixers up a dozen. Tobias Harris, Ben Simmons. Simmons, 24 points, eight rebounds, nine assists. Sixers win it by 14 points. A statement opening win for the Sixers. The question, of course, does remain, however, about Ben Simmons shooting the three. For the night, he continues to just work it inside. Not only did Philly score way more points in the paint than outside of it, they were able to get way more open looks in the paint as well. Meanwhile, Richard, let me run the floor. Number two overall pick, John Morant, his first game. 14 points, four assists, four rebounds in 25 minutes. How good is he going to be? I think he's going to be really good. He's going he's to get some lumps. He's playing against uh, the best point guard. This is the hardest position in the NBA, and he's in the Western Conference. But he's going he's gonna to be impressive, I think, by the end of the season. He was the second pick in the draft. The third pick was R.J. Barrett. He became just the third Knicks rookie ever to score 20 oh, points wow. in his NBA debut. Walked in there, big fella. They would lose a tough game in San Antonio. What are your thoughts on Barrett? Uh, I, I think R.J. Barrett's going to be the same. I think he's either going to lead them in scoring or probably be second in scoring. He's going to get all the opportunity. He's going to play 35 minutes a night, and I think he's going to get an opportunity to improve all year long. For exactly the reason you just gave, I've said I think he's going to wind up being rookie of the year. Marquee game on the schedule tonight. The last three NBA MVPs 
on the court at the same time because you'll have Giannis for Milwaukee taking on Westbrook and Harden for the Rockets. And you and I have not had a chance to talk about this as you've come back here now for the start of the season. What are your expectations for the pairing of Russell Westbrook and James Harden? I don't think it's going to work. I don't think it's going to work the way they want it to work. I think this was kind of a bold move by Daryl Morey. He was like, we got to try something. You have to have at least two superstars. The Chris Paul situation wasn't working. Uh, I think uh, Oklahoma City was looking to retool. But look, this is my thing. If it didn't work with Kevin Durant, who was a willing superstar, and if it didn't work with Chris Paul, tell me why this is going to work. What is it about a guy that has averaged a triple-double three straight years, couldn't play, didn't really accomplish anything with Paul George or Kevin Durant. Why is it now going to work with James Harden, who is less of a defender and seems more on the selfish side of basketball? Explain to me how those two pairings work. I can't. The only thing I could... I, I can't. I mean, I, I can't. I, I can't. The thing I could offer is they both, I think, are a stage of their careers where they have accomplished everything that you can accomplish besides winning a championship. And do they decide to sacrifice whatever it is in their individual games now in pursuit of that goal? That's the question. Well, you could say that, but let's look at history, right? Great players. Like a Carmelo Anthony is a great player. And we saw a decline from Car Carmelo Anthony over a two- or three-year stretch. Yeah. But there was a time there where you're like, hey, Carmelo can leave the Knicks and go play on a really, really good team. And he decided to take the money and stay with the Knicks. Because ultimately, who you are in the beginning a lot of times is who you are in the end. So these two guys will be very good. I'm not saying that their team can't make a run, but I don't know if this is going to be a pairing that like that Houston wants. I just think this is the best opportunity for them to be I good. I agree, actually, with everything you said. Oh, we'll take a break. You. As we continue, Joe Burrow has emerged as a serious Heisman candidate. LSU is rolling. Acho 